Welcome to today's Sunday School Lesson. Today's teaching is from the book of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 1 through 10. Verse 1. About that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Verse 2. Jesus called a little child to him and put the child among them. Verse 3. Then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Verse 4. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Verse 5. And anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. Verse 6. But if you cause one of these little ones who trusts in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Verse 7. What sorrow awaits the world, because it tempts people to sin. Temptations are inevitable, but what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting? Verse 8. So if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life with only one hand or one foot than to be thrown into eternal fire with both of your hands and feet. Verse 9. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life with only one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. Verse 10. Beware that you don't look down on any of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels are always in the presence of my heavenly Father. This is a great teaching presented by Ron Allen. Let's watch and listen as Ron begins this presentation. But uh, let's just begin our time with prayer here. Lord, thank you. Thank you for giving us this very time, this hour, to uh, spend in your holy word. We've told the, one of the writers there in the scripture that the word is like a mirror. And we look into it, we may see ourselves a little better than we do otherwise. And sometimes we don't like what we see. But sometimes, Lord, you give us an opportunity to do something about it and uh, to turn and to change. These are all words that sometimes are hard to hear. But Lord, I pray that you will uh, help us as we look into this uh, study just for a few minutes here this morning. Bless each person who is here. I do pray for each one who is here. Um, whatever issues that may be going on in each one of their lives this morning that you would enter in in power and do your work in each one of our lives today in the name of Jesus I pray amen, amen. okay uh, if you'll take a look at your text there we'll begin there with verse 1 um, verse 1 says about this time about that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, about this time, that's an important preposition right there. And it's really important to look at where we are. And it, it'll be, you'll see what I mean as we look into this a little bit. But um, an important way to start this chapter because uh, the subject of these 10 verses that we're looking at is humility. It's humility. And so what we need to do is look, first of all, at what's happening about that time. What's happening to the disciples about that time. It, it's no accident that the Holy Spirit put that phrase in there, about that time. And so I want you to, uh, to turn back just to chapter 17. You're, you're at 18, and if you have your Bibles, which I hope you do, I will be asking you to look at some verses, but turn, in, turn to Matthew chapter 17, the chapter just before the one that we're studying here this morning. By the way, we did look at the last half of chapter 18 when I taught a few months ago, and it goes on uh, it's forgiveness. But I chose this because it, it's the reading, you know, the reading for yesterday. 
and I hope you are all doing that reading, but I try to stay with the, those texts. So the 17th chapter beginning says, after, And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother. And you know, James and John were fishermen. Peter had a brother, but, but Andrew is, never seems to be with, with the three. We don't really know why. But Peter, James, and John always had a, often had the privilege uh, physicians with Christ. He took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to him Moses and Elijah talking with him. This, uh, this event was truly an amazing and extraordinary happening in the lives of these disciples, uh, Peter, James, and John. In fact, uh, those who wrote about this in the scriptures struggled to try to bring out the meaning of that transfiguration and, and what it really meant, the, the dazzling idea of it. The ESV that we just read says, his clothes became white as light. Kind of picture that in your mind. Mark wrote, and Mark, of course, is heavily influenced by Peter in his writings of the Gospel of Mark. Mark wrote, uh, as the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed and his clothes became dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly bleach could ever make them. That's... Um, so we try to get the picture of that, uh, how, how really bright that was and how white that was. When Peter wrote about this, so Peter, when he wrote his letters later on, in the second letter Peter wrote, um, I'm just going to read this, you don't have to turn to it. He said, for we, we were not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw his majestic splendor. You know, I mean, that's something to have on your resume right there. With our own eyes, when he received honor and glory from God the Father, the voice from the majestic glory of God said to him, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. We ourselves heard that voice from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. This was an extraordinary event. And, you know, people have struggled with, uh, many people have struggled with that last verse of uh, chapter 16 just before the 17 we read because Jesus said there, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. It's kind of a puzzling statement. But I take it this way. I believe he's referring to the transfiguration, which just would happen in the next couple of verses. I might say that there are theologians who disagree with me. And it's all right for them to be wrong. I still love them, you know, and so forth. But um, when the writer of the book of Hebrews began his letter, uh, he stated this. He said, the sun, S-O-N, radiates God's own glory <laughs> and expresses the very character of God. So you get this idea of this, this glory, this brightness uh, happening here. Okay. Now, just hold that thought, that idea of the disciples being in on this really, really extraordinary event. And take your Bible and turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. And we'll look at this twice. Um, Philippians chapter 2. Very important chapter in, in theology. The second chapter of Philippians. And um, I'm not going to start at the beginning now, but I will when we approach it later on. Um, 
Verse 5, I want you to look, beginning. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. If you ever underline your Bible, underline those two words. Emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. This is, this is another one of those theological words. It's called kenosis in the Greek. Kenosis, <laughs> emptied himself. And this has been the uh, source of books and oh, so much written, you know, about this. What does it mean that Jesus emptied himself? Uh, when he said, you know, I know I'm equal with God up here and I got all this, but I'm, it's all right with me. But humble myself, go down and become a man and die on the cross and so forth. Um, but he emptied himself. Now I was speaking with someone just recently and this came up. And I, I had nothing to do with this lesson because I wasn't even involved in it at that time. And we were talking about Philippians 2. And I, I said, emptied himself, and the person said, yeah, uh, of his deity. And I said, oh, I held my hand up like that. He said, no, brother, no. Jesus never emptied himself no, of his deity. No, no. He was always Christ. Yeah. He was always God with all the attributes of God. And so, and this is where the cults come down, just a warning to you. And be careful of the word of faith people like that who come down and depreciate Christ when he was on this earth as not as, that, not that he was literally God. But I want to get into that. But anyway, um, I believe it means he emptied himself of his glory. We're talking about the glory, but... No one could have seen, looked at his glory as it was in heaven and even lived, right? They would have dropped dead, right? You can't look at him and live. Isn't that true? Now, some have. Moses and, you know, the elders and those who went up on the mountain with him who were right there in the presence of God. You remember his face shone when he come down? He said his face, he had to put a veil over his face because they reflected the glory of God and so forth. I always thought that was really amazing. And then Paul talks about that in Corinthians later on, about how, you know, the, the glory of God w with unveiled faces, you know. And I always thought that was really, really, really neat. Um, anyway, um, kenosis. He emptied himself of his glory. So you might ask the question, you might say, okay, if he emptied himself of his glory, then why was Peter, James, and John able to see him, see his glory? And do you, you want me to answer that? Or, sure. Sure. I don't know the answer. <laughs> so, but, but that's a natural question, isn't it? It begs that question, actually. And, um, and yet, uh, you know... I won't pursue any farther into that, but I think that uh, it was it was so much uh, it was so much above and beyond earthly things, you know, that we would we can describe and everything. It was it was just amazing. Now, the reason I went to all of this before we get into this is, and we look back at Matthew 17 and the verses regarding the glory of Jesus is because I believe that it figures large in the text that we're in this morning. Because Peter, James, and John were privileged to something that no other disciple or any person would ever see, at least that's recorded in the Bible or history. They saw Jesus in his glory. If anyone in all history, listen, 
If anyone in all of history had the temptation to become proud, it were those three men. Wouldn't it be? Oh, look what I saw. Look where I've been. And so the Holy Spirit begins chapter 18 with these words about that time. The disciples came to Jesus and said, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Why would someone ask a question like that? You think? Why do you think someone would ask a question like that? Power and influence. Yeah, power. Self on the throne. Has anyone here ever asked that question? You don't have to admit it. But think about it, you know. You ever been in conversation with people, you know, your friends, and the little conversation comes up about heaven. They say, yeah, well, you're going to be on that cloud. You're going to be so high. I'm not even going to see you when I get up to heaven. And we, we talk about hierarchy, you know. That, it's, in, it's in our DNA as human beings to uh, think levels of, you know, of uh, importance. And so forth. It is. It's just naturally in us. And um, so, <laughs> there's no doubt in my mind that those three disciples were seeing themselves pretty high on the ladder of privileged people. Who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And I, and I think you're right, Jim. You, that's what motivates power. And what was the other word you used? Influence. Influence, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's somewhere in our inner workings of the heart of mankind that uh, makes us that way. I never, now I'm truly, I tried to think about this when I was studying this. I don't think I ever, I always used to say, because I was so shy as a kid, I was so shy, I could already talk to anybody or anything. And I said, when I became a Christian, I said, I just want to get in there. I mean, I just want to make it through the door. <laughs> and if I don't have this certain harp or whatever you get, I'd be glad to be there, you know. But uh, to say who is the greatest? Who said who is the great? Who said I'm the greatest in your lifetime? Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali. I'm the greatest in the world. Remember that? Well. So, verse 2 in your text. I'm taking way too much time here. Verse 2. Jesus called a little child to him and put the child among them. Now, we don't know who this child is. It's interesting. If you read uh, theological books about this, they'll say, well, this, this little boy became Ignatius, who was a well-known you know, Christian early history. I don't know where they get that. I think it's just something someone came up with. But it's interesting that they were in Peter's house. You read that earlier on. All the disciples in Peter's house. So maybe it was one of Peter's kids, you know. And, of course, they would have known Christ, and Christ would have known them, and they would have easily responded to Jesus when he said, come over here. And, uh, but I think Jesus would have been the kind of person that any of us would want to come and see, wouldn't he? I mean, I think it's just his presence, his countenance, his love, his, who he was, that you couldn't resist going up to him and saying, I want to be with you. I think that's true. But um, uh, he put the child among them, it says. So, so here's the thing. Now, here's all the disciples in Peter's house. Yeah, picture them in your mind. If you have to close your eyes, close your eyes. But picture these disciples. You know, rugged fishermen, tax collectors, various people, and just kind of, and, and they look. It's like they're looking over their shoulder, you know, and they got kind of this slight scowl on their face. What's that about? You know, kids are nothing. You know, let's just, talk adult stuff here while we're here. This, what's this about? And um, their faces kind of showed it. And um, there's an incident in Mark, uh, in Mark chapter 10. Let me just read it here. You can turn to it if you want. It's Mark 10 beginning with uh, verse 13.
and they use a, he uses a word here. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. Rebuked is a strong word. Rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And then it's spoken also in, uh, in the Gospel of Luke. Now, in verse 6 of your text there, in verse 6, he uses this word, these words, um, little ones, you see it? But if you could cause one of these little ones, you see that in the text? Little ones is an interesting word because it's... Uh, it, it's a word, the real meaning of the word is uh, mikron, M-I-K-R-O-N. And it's a word that we get uh, our word micro from. And it literally means um, nobodies, nobodies. Uh, it's people who are, are overlooked uh, in society, outcast possibly, um, but they're... Uh, they're tiny, small, less, or nobody. And so that's what, what uh, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Every little child comes into the world looking for love. Some don't find it. Yeah, it's true. It's pretty sad. It is true. We'll it's see that sad. in a little few minutes, too. Yes. Yeah. And uh, so use that word, microns, nobodies. So... Uh, even the way we look at others, especially those who may be considered nobodies in the world, it doesn't have to be just a child. It could be someone, you know, challenged people who just are not attractive or there's something wrong. Sometimes you kind of overlook and push them aside. But it can be an indication of where we might be standing in our own humility. We'll see that. Verse 3. Then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins. And what word do we use when we say turn from your sins? <laughs> repent. Yeah, that's repentance. And become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Um, now we all know, just like you said, I think we all know what it means to turn from your sins. Uh, <coughs> I think each of us who are here this morning knows our own personal lives. We know what areas that we could say that we sin in and that we're guilty of and we may be doing wrong. And we also know from Scripture that by the help of Almighty God and the indwelling Holy Spirit, um, those things can be changed in every life. And you can turn from your sin. There is a power. And so don't give up this morning. Uh, there's no doubt there's someone in this room today who is close to giving up on some of the things in their life because they say, I just can't do it. But with God, you can do it. Anything with his spirit. And um, one, we have the ability, once we've made up our mind, to turn away. To turn, like he said, to turn away. And we'll see a little bit more in a few moments on this. But become like little children. But become like little children. That's the phrase. Um, what do you think that means here? Um, let me ask you this. And just think about this while I'm going through what I'm going through. And maybe jot down on the bottom of your paper uh, a word or a phrase of what it means to become like little children. What do you think it means? And just if something comes to your mind, write it down, and we'll write it up here on the board. Humble. Humble, yes. So write it down there, and uh, humble's a good one. It's a, a lesson. And um, so, oh, I'll tell you what. Um, since you're doing it now, uh, I'll have Miss Sarah come up. And... Um, Miss, Miss uh, Sarah is, has perfect 
writing. Uh -oh. Pressure's on. And, uh, so it was humble, and what was the other word? Someone Trust. trusting. Innocent. Yeah, age of innocence. Okay, hold that. Um, trusting innocence. Yeah, I think there is a better one. Simple, simple, I guess we can't do the whole paragraph, but simple, we understand what that means. They're simple in their understanding of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Simple in understanding. Okay. That one gets two points. Dependent? Yes. Dependent. Admitting that they were wrong. Admitting they're wrong? Admitting that they were wrong, that they had, had, had changed their mind. Okay, I was thinking about, um, yeah. Um, I guess I'm a humble Yeah. 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 So the only way they learned and understood was through these parables. Mm -hmm. And children in that era, um, they didn't have a voice. They were really overlooked. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I suppose overlooked would be the word. Uh, people, they're without, children. They're without standing. Without standing, all. maybe that's a good way of saying it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They don't have to see to believe. Okay. Um, that would be, uh, can you narrow that down to? Um, they don't have to see to believe was a statement. Um, uh, say believe, believe without seeing, having to see or something. I think that's a good one. Yes. I think the most important word is open. Open? Yeah. Because okay. We look at all those other things. As children, we're open to learning. It's a natural part of what we do. Children will accept Without things. seeing, yeah. Yeah. Open? Open, yeah. Okay, that's, that's a good list. Does anyone else have one to add? All right. All right, thank you. All right. All right, now let's turn back in your Bible to the Philippians text again. Philippians chapter 2. So now here's what we're going to do. Because when Christ, when Christ came, left heaven, it's, it's a perfect picture of humility. And so the Apostle Paul describes humility when he describes um, Christ leaving heaven. And we just need to look at this. Because it's really important when we talk about we all need we all need this. This idea of be, being humble. It's something it's a, a primary characteristic of a Christian. So beginning with verse one in chapter two of Philippians. So if there is any encouragement in Christ are you encouraged in Christ? Yes. Yes. Encouraged in Christ. Are you encouraged in your life? Because you are a Christian. Do you sense a sense of encouragement in your life? It's a really good question. Um, any comfort from love. Oh friends, how important this is. Do you realize that the reason there is so much adultery and so much illicit um, intimate relationships is because people are seeking love. People want love. And they, and they find just a few moments, a few minutes of love, and then, they, and then it's no more. Because the only true love we find is in Christ, any comfort in love. And 
when you find the comfort in the love of Christ, it just uh, it yes. it cuts off a lot of that other stuff that you're seeking all the time, seeking all the time, and you're getting it from Him. This is such an important phrase. Any comfort from His love? Can you answer that question? Any participation in the Spirit? Um, any affection and sympathy. Now these are characteristics of humble people. Sympathy and affection. That means looking at people and caring at what state they're in, what it's about in their lives. He says, complete my joy by being of the same mind. Now the next few phrases use this thing. Uh, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. So you see unity as a, a real characteristic when it comes to humility. Unity. Not always fighting and, and always having to have my way. You know. And uh, that's what that's about. You, verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in Humility, see the word there? In humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not on his, to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and, verse 8, and being found in human form, he humbled himself. See it, the word? Humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Those are pictures of if you maybe you may ask yourself am I humble <laughs> that's a good question to ask there's nothing wrong with that and maybe reread you know a text like that now and then verse 5 and anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me um, this is really an interesting phrase because he's talking about people who are willing to um, get down on their hands and knees and look a little child in the face and say, I want to tell you about my best friend, Jesus Christ. Someone who's willing to teach children yes. about Jesus. That all the children need to be taught about Jesus. All the children do. Once they grow up and don't hear those things, you see them on the news, you know, killing people and robbing people and all this and that. But anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my half is welcoming me. My, when I grew up in the out, kind of a little country road outside of town, but there was houses up and down. And uh, my mom had, we were, I was a teenager, my brothers and I, and my mom had what they called... Um, Child evangelism. So they invited all the kids, you know, in the neighborhood to come to our house. And this lady up the road, and uh, oh, I just remember her. She just, she when she was in front of those kids, she owned them. She just was so wonderful. She taught, but she taught with power. She taught with love. And the kids were just listening. And us, my mom had us just be there to be, you know, kind of, corral the kids if they got out, but we didn't have to. This gal taught, and I, I just can't imagine all the children. I wonder where they are now, <laughs> you know. And verse 6, but if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it'd be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Notice that Jesus differentiates in millstones. I never noticed this before, but most of the homes had their own millstone. 
They're heavy. Probably no one could hardly lift one, maybe this big. He's talking about the ones that the animals pull, you know, and grind the big mound. They think weigh tens of thousands of pounds. Imagine that tied to your neck and dropped into the depths of the sea. You'd get down there pretty fast, and that'd be it for you. And um, verse 7 says, What sorrow awaits the world? Because it tempts people to sin. Yes, I'm sorry. That phrase, the little child um, uh, who trusts in me, what about the kids that don't trust and yet adults, what they're doing to kids today? That phrase, who trusts in me, I guess that's just, it's every child, right? It's every child. He's talking here about, uh, it, could, it could be any new Christian. Any, anyone who has uh, decided for Christ and then someone turns them away, you know, and, and this happens. But I'm thinking about what adults are doing to our children yeah. today. Yeah. Be they, are they trusting in Christ or not, you know, some have never heard. Yeah. But I, I can see Jesus putting a millstone around the lot of that. Well, yeah, especially the school boards yeah. that are shoving yeah. around there. To oh, well, he uses the word the world here. The world are all. Wrong. Yes. I kind of go by actions speak louder than words. Actions speak louder than words. Yes. Because if you're living it, yes. these children see that. Yeah. Amen. I think that's part of the whole process. You know, they're drawn to Christ because of your life. Yes, absolutely. Um, so what sorrow awaits the world, verse 7, because it tempts people to sin. The temptations are ine inevitable, it says, and that's true. Uh, that's all, there's all, Because we're in sinful bodies, people are always going to be tempted. Uh, but what sorrow awaits a person who does the tempting? That's the uh, that's what happens. Now, before we go a little farther here, um, and by the way, thanks for that list. I appreciate your input on that. Um, some of you, how many of you have seen the movie The Sound of Freedom? Quite a few. A few of you have, yeah. Um, I think you should see it if you haven't. I think it's, it's not only a good movie just from making a movie standpoint. Of course, the message uh, just grips your heart, really does. Um, it's heartbreaking to see what's happening to children who are stolen away and uh, sold around the world for sex. And, um, uh, and it's happening by the tens of thousands. It's happening in our communities. Mm -hmm. They show a few shots in this film of, of it actually happening. Things that were picked up on these cameras that are out in the streets where, you know, a lady's leaning in her car, putting one kid in, and someone drives right on a motorcycle and grabs the kid out. And probably she never saw him again, you know. This happens by the tens of thousands. It's a 150 billion industry mm -hmm. and it rises every month by 5%. 150 billion dollar industry. Uh, and it's happening in northwest Arkansas. Mm -hmm. People are being taken. Yes, ma'am. I think it's awesome that this, this actor was willing to go and make that movie. Yes. Yeah, the movie was made five years ago, and that yeah, had a hard time getting it, getting it out. Um, but but it shows to me, it showed just the depth of the sinfulness of mankind, the depth, the the ugly, pervasive, terrible way that one that one human being could treat another like that. It just it just can't imagine. And nearly unbelievable. 
uh, how any man or woman can do what they do to children for their own pleasure and for money. And they're so young. Yes, they can be young. And I think that now a lot of us pray for into the light. Um, many probably some of you in this room pray with Anna on uh, from these these uh, mostly ladies I think that are out there and just need help. But we can pray. I was telling Karen we we're talking. I said we can pray for these children. Well, you don't have to know their name or know what they look like. God knows our prayers. And we need to pray for them. That God would, you know, strengthen and uphold and do what only He can do. Yes, ma'am. And the saying He put down that God's children are not for sale. Yes. And that gets you so hard. Yeah. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Watt, a teaching ministry yeah. that focuses on God's yeah. unconditional. God's children are not for sale. That's right. That's right. The last two minutes of it when he was talking. Yes. That's what got me even. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Jesus Students of American history might be interested to know that Abraham Lincoln quoted Matthew 18:7, this verse we just read, in his second inaugural address. He phrased it as woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Amen. And Lincoln's application related to slavery based on race, the same, the idea that humans would extract labor from others against their will and exploit them for their own ends. And of course that's what happened. When Karen and I were in Russia, um, we had a lady on our team from the United States who came to, from Russia to the United States and she was, so we, we went to see we visited her family there. Well, we went out in the country. It was a dasha, they got a dacha or something. He called it out there. It was a little farm, a few acres, and just a little house. It was like a summer home of this lady's sister and her husband, their family. And uh, oh, you should have seen that garden. They had everything in that garden. It was it, there wasn't an inch that they didn't have some herbs, and you know it was just amazing. But anyway, we're standing inside the house, and uh, the husband of the gal's sister is sitting at a table, red face. He's drinking vodka like crazy, and um, and his wife is just standing quietly there. And I looked up on the wall, and there's a picture of a lovely young lady. And I said, "Well, who's who's this?" Just trying to make conversation, you know. She says, That's our daughter. She disappeared when she was 16 years old. She, uh, she came down here and did the chores. Um, she got off the bus, it was about a half mile up the little road up to the highway. She went back up there to take the bus and she's never seen again. It just haunted me. It just, because I had girls, you know, in this. And she was 16, you know, I mean, she wasn't like a little kid. And she's never been seen since. And this uh, gal, this mother of this, little, of this girl, went to church every day up the road. There's a, or, a Orthodox church. She went there every day and prayed for her daughter. And uh, it, it, that's, that really grabbed me, that thing, that idea that someone could disappear like that. I used to teach my girls when they're little because I worried about this too. Sure. I, I taught them dirty tricks, you know, to do in case some guy grabs them, you know. And there's things they can do, you know, they can grab their little pinky finger and that just put, that'll put the biggest man out of commission because he can't handle that or stuff like that, you know. Because I was always worried about it, you know, and I said, never, never get in the car. You know, and if they get you in the car, cause an accident. You know, grab the steering wheel, do something. Anyway, anyway, um, when Karen and I were married about three years, 1969, um, in Des Moines, Iowa, a, uh, a boy disappeared. He was a paper boy. He was on the national news. The news quite a bit. His name was Johnny Gosh. He'd never been found to this day. It's a cold case. 
and it's still there. The case is still there. But every day you saw on the news, it says, well, he was wearing a white shirt and this and that. And, and you know, paper boys, they go out early in the morning, usually, to get their papers and do their thing. And, um, and he's never been found. Uh, what sorrow awaits the world? because it tempts people to sin. Temptations are inevitable, but what sorrow awaits that person who does the tempting? So, if you find yourself um, involved in a lifestyle or a habit in your life, or a variety of acts that harm children, that could harm children, cut it, cut it out immediately, stop it. Stop it immediately. That's what he's trying to say here with these next two verses. Um, if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life with only one hand or one foot than to be thrown in eternal fire with both of your hands and feet. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life with only one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. And um, I believe that Jesus here is referring to folks who, when he says, uh, he, he's asking them to change their mind about their actions and turn to God. That's what he means, turn to God. Turn away, he means turn to me. Turn to God. Like in verse 3 where he said, unless you turn and become like little children, he yes. means turn toward me. Yes. Um, and literally cut the lifestyle, the habit, the thing that you're doing uh, out of your life. Just like you would with a knife, cut something out and turn to God. It's, uh, it's hyperbole, yes, but it's important to God that we don't just continue on as Christians saying I you know I know God forgives me and he does but that we take a look at our lives and say what are we doing what how is my life affecting you know the people around me and do it do it now Otherwise, their destination is indescribably terrible. And he talks to Christians as well. Let me just read Paul's writing, and you can turn to it with me. It's Colossians chapter 3. It's just a page or two over from that Philippians text you had open. Um, Colossians chapter 3. Begin verse 5. I'll wait a minute until you get it. Colossians 3, 5. Okay. Interesting words he uses here. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality. Now remember, he's talking to Christians here. Impurity. Passion, evil, desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming, and these you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth, and so on. Put off. The old self, he's saying, and put on the new. So verse 10 in the text says, um, Beware that you don't look down on any of these little ones. Remember the word for little ones? Can anyone tell me what it was? Micron. Micron, yeah. For I tell you that in heaven their angels are always in presence of my heavenly Father. That's one verse of scripture that I always, uh, I always had a hard time understanding. 
Many teach that that's talking about guardian angels. Uh, I think that all of God's angels guard all of us. I think they, they're messengers for us all. The fact that we might just have one, I, I'm not sure. I, I don't closely take that. But um, interestingly, the angels see every detail of what happens and is happening to every person. Every child, we're talking about children here. And that knowledge is known by the Heavenly Father and they're in the face of the Heavenly Father, the angels. So all this is known. And we must understand, we must believe as Christians today and not get discouraged that justice will happen. God is just. There's not a thing that he will ever miss. Not a thing that he will ever miss. That's either happened to you, your children, people you know. Um, their angels see every detail of what happens. That's what he's talking about here. If I tell you that in heaven, their angels are always in the presence of my heavenly Father. He knows everything. Yes, ma'am. You know, the United States is the number one producer of yes. child abuse Thank you. material. Mm -hmm. We are also the number one of consumer of sex. Yeah. The United States is. Yes. And then when you think about that, and then it gives me peace knowing that angels are watching over those children. Yes. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. So, what about us here today? We need to close or out of time, but um, are we are we inclined to humility? Can you look at yourself and say, am I? Uh, I think this text is supposed to cause us to do that, to look and say, am I inclined to be a humble individual? Ron, yes. I'm thinking of the children. You know, when, you see, when you're in like the Walmart parking lot and you see a yeah. woman loading a couple yeah. kids into the car, she's got that cart to take back, and you see them and they leave the kids sitting there. I always ask if I can take the cart back for her. Yes. Yes. And I think that points up that we should all be aware of what's going on around us at all times. Yeah. And I mean, it isn't just certainly in America, but I spent a lot of time traveling to Thailand, and there, you yes. know, the, the I'll call them promoters go out into the country because the the, the children, you know, have don't seem to have a whole lot of uh, value, especially yeah. the girls. And so for, you know, a couple U.S. dollars, they can buy that girl and take her, and boys, and take her to the, um, the nightclubs, they call them, in yes. like Bangkok and whatever. Yes. Um, and so then they're in, you know. By the way, since you mentioned that, uh, Tim Tebow is quite active in this, uh, has, a, has a program that rescues children. And uh, I think Thailand is one of the places where he is, but he, he told about this little girl, Mimi, and uh, said that while in Africa, Demi and I had the chance to meet sweet Mimi, if you, we, she said that, that Mimi said, we were beaten, tortured, and men would use us in ways that were not human. I saw so many ladies die because they had been tortured, kidnapped, and dismembered by the men. People who needed human sacrifices for their witchcraft would come and steal women off of the streets and take them to the witch doctor because they knew no one cared. Once I was sold to a cannibal. I didn't even know until I reached the house and saw all of his weapons. I was so scared. I escaped and slept in a banana plantation as he searched for me that night. We weren't considered to be human beings, and so forth. And that's good, uh, good to support, I think, those kind of organizations. Or testimony. Uh, uh, we heard of a uh, woman who was in India, and she was, um, she was 
on a bus going to her destination. And unbeknownst to her, the bus was going to the temple to where human sacrifices were to take place. And she had just been given a little New Testament. And she was sitting in the room. They had disclosed and disrobed her completely. She was reading in that testament. And when when she was taken to the priest, um, she uh, he looked at her and looked at that book. And he said, get that woman out of here. That book is nothing but trouble. And they let her go. It was the word of God. I bet it was a Gideon Bible. Right? <laughs> yeah. I love those kind of stories. Yeah. What? Yes, Charlie. You asked earlier why were uh, Peter, James, and John able to see the transfiguration. Um, I've always been taught, had they not seen the transfiguration, we wouldn't even be able to... We, they were witnesses, and we wouldn't have that record. That we can't visualize what that's really like. You've got a white board behind you. We, we got, we're sitting around white tables. Alan's got a white shirt on. Artie's got white hair. Uh, and, and, and I'm sorry, Careful. Artie, but that white doesn't compare to what the transfiguration looks like. And yes. without them being able to see that, yes. we wouldn't have that mindset of what was that like. You're right. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Well, I think the most important thing, and it does lend to that, it's called being aware. We have to be aware of what's going on around us. Yeah. Yeah. We can't walk anymore around the streets and keep our heads down, right, with all of the things that are going on. If we're not looking up and around, yes. we do we don't have the opportunity. There could be an opportunity to help someone. Yeah. And I think that society now would walk with our heads down. Yeah. And so if we don't see it, we don't know. Yeah. Thank you. That's we important. Thanks, that. brother. Look, we also That's have exactly to say something. Yeah. 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 Yes. Well, I sure appreciate your, uh, your attendance and interest in this. I know, I know there's more that can be said. And uh, let's pray. Father, I do thank you now for the few moments we've been able to spend here together and looking at uh, things that it just seems like there's happier things we could talk about, but we know this is reality. This is where we are. We need your help, Lord. We need your help as those who would help others uh, to know how to be alert and what to look for and how to save our children, Lord. Oh, I pray that you will help us and that you help all those children right now who are all over the world in, in uh, places where they're being mistreated. And God, I just pray for each one today that you would comfort their little heart and their little mind. In Jesus' name, amen.